So we're, we're going to be talking about assessment, and I want to have all of you think about assessment um, with its Latin root. So to sit beside, um, this is an opportunity for us to think about working alongside of our students and getting feedback from them as um, they give us, uh, as we give them feedback. So my contact information is on the front. If you'd like to email me, um, sammykaysmith at gmail.com. Okay, um, assessing um, assessment versus evaluation. Uh, this is the thing that I really want to impress as we go through, and it's an interesting opportunity right now in the time of COVID, um, how we think about assessment, what we want our students to walk away from our classes, knowing, thinking, feeling about Latin. So this isn't about grading. This is about feedback. This is about looking at learning as a process. It's about um, thinking about how to give students our observations, how students can give each other observations, how they can continue to adjust to their learning as we go through. It can take a host of different forms. Um, and most importantly, it's personal. Um, I'm sure that some of you are doing synchronous teaching, meaning that you're on Zoom um, or Google Meet, and some of you are doing asynchronous teaching, meaning that you are recording lessons and have very little contact with your students. Um, I feel a real gift at this moment in time for being able to um, see my students on a regular basis, to work with them. Um, that to me is, is quite lovely. And uh, I think the real meaning of what we do as teachers. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about the Cambridge Latin course objectives. And of course, the two major objectives are to teach um, comprehension of Latin for reading. Fundamentally, this is what we're after here. This is why we want to learn Latin. Um, and that um, to do that, um, in this particular course, it's with reference to the first century, but we think about content, we think about style, we think about Roman civilization, um, history and culture, and all of those things feed into our notion of comprehension. The aims of the course um, are to develop fluency and appreciation, and I really want to highlight these particular things. These are straight out, out of the um, Unit 3 Teacher's Manual, the fifth edition. You can pull all of these off of the Cambridge Elevate website. Um, it's got a host of materials for you to use. But the thing that you really want to be paying attention to is not only should students, and especially at this time, as everyone feels so isolated, feel that they're learning something, but they should walk away from their class loving Latin, loving reading. It's something that I often hear English teachers talking about, English teachers talk about wanting to have their students become lifelong readers. I don't hear that as much from Latin teachers. And that's something that I think Cambridge is certainly interested in supporting. Um, my objectives, the measurable objectives, I break down into four major categories, vocabulary, language, reading, and culture. So I've taken Cambridge's objective of reading and I've kind of parsed it out to make it a little bit easier to think about how I can give my students more specific feedback as they're going through the Cambridge Latin course and beyond. Um, I have a separate section for habits of mind, which I'm not going to talk about here, but all of these things, vocabulary, language, and culture, funnel into reading. Um, so of my five major objectives, the fifth one, habits of mind, not on here, I, I see that reading is the central component. I also included my unmeasurable objectives, um, and I think this is particularly important. I want my students to walk away from my classroom loving everything to do about reading, being moved by what they read, to challenge the historical practices of ancient Rome, to take risks in discussion, and to create a community. That's really what we're doing when we're talking about assessment. There are all sorts of bells and whistles that we can um, add on by um, doing these online assessments. You can be just as old school or just as um, new and innovative as you want. The bottom line, you should be thinking about how you can build community with our kids, especially now. Okay, vocabulary is my first. 
these are my three main objectives that I've broken down, and I'll give you some ideas about how I use them to help kids think about how they're um, acquiring vocabulary, what they need to work on, and they always come back. They circle back to these. And the wonderful thing about Cambridge is that it cycles back again and again. If you are worried that they're not going to get vocabulary the first time around, those words are definitely going to show up uh, in later stories. So I separate them with meanings of words, forms of Latin words, and derivatives. Probably a lot of you have done muscae. Um, this is um, a muscae that has infinitives on it. Um, you can do this on Zoom or Google Meet. You can have kids do this at home. Um, and it's pretty easy. You can have them cut things up or tear them out if they even don't have access to scissors. Um, I've got a combination of both present active and present passive infinitives. And what I want to do is I start them off um, in my own Zoom classes by um, having them either print out sheets or they can write them down if they don't have a printer. I try not to have too many words just so that um, they're getting a lot of uh, reinforcement of the same things. They're seeing patterns. And um, I give them, for example, agare and agi. You um, get to see a nice differentiation between the two. At the end, not always, but often, I will put a student rating at the bottom and a teacher rating. So I will say, how do you think you did on meanings? What were you struggling with with regard to forms? And they give themselves a rating and I give them a rating. Um, sometimes they give each other ratings um, and then they take over and they, um, in their breakout rooms in Zoom, if you're lucky enough to have Zoom and you can send students off into um, their own breakout rooms, they can quiz each other on vocabulary in this way. Any questions thus far? I think that's good. Great. Oh, Julia's saying, what is muscae? Oh, um, it's, it's fly swatter vocab. So um, I tell my students the story about Domitian and his stylus swatting flies, or maybe not swatting, uh, punching flies. And so they use their fingers like a stylus to tap on the word um, that is correct. They love to do this in the classroom. Um, and in Zoom, it's been kind of fun because they, they do a lot of kind of virtual tapping against each other. It's like, no, 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 I know I got it first. Um, they can mark it with a pencil as well. It's pretty fun to do. Um, I, when I was teaching, um, reviewing indirect statements with students, um, I suggested to students, I, I bought a package of M&Ms and I virtually handed them M&Ms through the screen as markers if they wanted. I mean, they were reaching up. It was quite darling. Um, sophomores will do anything. <laughs> so but in, physically in the same room that you have it on the screen or they have one in front of them? Um, I used to do it. That's a great question. I used to do it on the screen and um, I found that a lot of students weren't participating except for the two that were up on the screen. Yeah. And so yeah. what I've done now is I print out a sheet of paper for every two to three students, depending upon whom I have in the classroom, if I have an odd number, they stand up. They're not allowed to use sharp uh, tools because I don't want anyone hurt. They can use their fingers. Um, even with their fingers, they uh, with one finger, they can get a little um, exuberant. Um, and I also do silent cheering with them. So I have them close their eyes and raise their fists and open their mouths um, and they cheer as silently loudly as possible just to maintain some decorum in the classroom and so that other teachers don't kick us out. So if you were not, if you're doing with this with Zoom and Marley, Martha and I were your, your students, could you just play it out for a split second? Because we have a question, how exactly do you do it on Zoom? Sure, I would start it out um, with my um, calling out. So my students would have their own words, um, everyone um, in the classroom together in what I like to call waffle mode. So there, or Brady Bunch mode, it, it's like a, a bunch of squares. And um, I can see all of the students. They show me the words that they've written down or that they've printed out if they've got access to a printer. And I call out posse. And um, they're supposed to reach down and tap. And then they hold up their paper and they show me where they tapped. And I can see very clearly, ah, to be able, you're right, or can, that's totally fine. Um, and if they tapped on pugnare, then I know that uh, we need to work again. And so I 
tell them, oh, nope, you want pulse, and then we do the next one. And gotcha. I like to do um, very uh, short little reviews so back and forth. So I'll say, um, to be able, and they'll tap pulse. And then I'll say, to give, and they'll tap dare. And then I'll say, to be able again, just as a quick rehash so that they're remembering pulse. Well, and they also don't do that thing of she's never going to call those two so I can ignore them. Exactly. A, a, per, a percentage thing more than a knowledge thing. Yeah. You know, when I used to do this with the, um, I used to fly swatters and then I eventually did what you did with the papers in front of them. And one of the things I did was I had everybody make on a, um, it used to be on um, tongue press, but eventually became a pencil. We, they had to put something soft. We had a picture of Caecilius or something. So they, when they slapped down, the only part that hit the paper was the, the woozy part. It couldn't hurt anybody, you know. Um, I t threatened to do flowers at one point, but the boys. <laughs> <laughs> so we just put a picture of a character or something. I believe somebody exactly. actually put a big fly or something, yeah. But thank you. I think that answers the question. And again, um, you don't have to have the students rate themselves. I put this on here. You're not going to see this particular rating um, later, but if you return back to slide eight, I think this is in, in the PowerPoint. Um, it's I have basically the same kind of rating system every time I go through something that I want to get student specific feedback on. Otherwise, I just mark it down in my own grade book for my own means about um, what I see I need to work on with students. So I just put a mark next to not next to student names necessarily unless I see them really struggling, but I will put a mark next to I need to work on this particular skill in my class. So that's a really important shift. That's the shift from how badly or how well, but badly are my students doing to what do I need to do to make them learn the material? So that's a really good shift because that's I think what what a grading has always been about telling them whether they hit the mark or not. You're, you're telling yourself whether you hit the mark or not. Exactly. So much about our teaching is getting feedback from students about what we need to change in our instruction. I agree. Assessment. OK, thank you. My pleasure. Um, this is something I learned with um, the Globe Theatre. I got the opportunity to work with the Globe Theatre, and you can do this with a host of things. It works particularly well with pronouns. So you can do it as early as ego and two. You can do it with hick and illa um, or is, ea, id. Um, and you take a text. Um, if your students are really struggling with something as basic as I don't know what a pronoun is, um, you can do a thing called slapping the pronoun. So you print out a piece of the text or every time they, um, if in this age, if they don't have access to a printer, they should have access to a sheet of paper. Um, every time they see a pronoun, they just hit the paper. So quis est tu? Ego sum lucius caeculis jucundus. Tu est pompeianus. And so you get this uh, really uh, vibrant uh, hitting. You can um, mute the students if you want, but I think the cacophony is quite nice to hear from the students when you hear them slapping the pronouns. And then you can put them in breakout rooms or you can um, have them do as a whole class and they're pointing. So for whatever reason this year, my ninth graders really struggled with two and ego. They just had the hardest time understanding what two was. And so every time they do two, they point away from themselves. Every time they do ego, they point toward themselves. This is stuff that um, Globe Theatre actors in England do as they're going through their own texts in English. So why not use it in Latin? I think that's very, I see that a lot with, when I was doing an eighth grade class, that they would always set, point back with both thumbs to themselves, as they said, ego and add guns to two. And if it was somebody else, they'd point to the left and the right with their fingers. Um, well, one finger, if it was singular, two fingers, if it was plural. But it really helped them get the sense of what these words, in, to internalize the words, not just know the meaning. Exactly. And with the um, with something like WOS um, to make your fingers in a two and then you have them hold it up and show that it's a V is an easy way for them to remember that as well. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> Found poetry is something that my juniors last year adored. Um, we would go through a text 
And then um, I would do a game where I would shut the lights off and they would call out any word or phrase that they remembered from a text that they had just read together, that we had just read together. And then they would write down whatever they heard their peers say, and they would put it in the form of a poem. It doesn't have to be long, um, but it's quite nice to have them either, if you're lucky enough to have a classroom, I'm in a bunch of different classrooms, or I was before this, now I'm in my home in New York City. Um, but you can have them put it on Google Docs and create a, a history of found poetry. And it's a wonderful, wonderful way for them to think about poetry, and they've created a little bit of ownership themselves. These kids have not yet read Catullus. Boy, am I bringing this back to them when they read Catullus. Absolutely. And boy, will they have a relationship with it. Good Lord, they will think that they were as good as Catullus, that they'd come up with <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Um, close exercises to me can be used in a variety of ways if you want to push through a longer story. I particularly like them when my students are struggling with words. I translate the whole passage. I pull out the words that I know they are struggling with. I give them the blanks to help them. Sometimes it trips them up a little bit, um, but it forces their hand at thinking about words that they have been stumbling over um, for quite some time. Um, and if they're still not getting it, I have them highlight it. And um, then I have them create little cards in which to think about how they're going to go back. Uh, could be a post-it, it could be, um, could be some little uh, uh, performance that they do in order to remember the word uh, to keep it in their head. Um, lastly is derivatives. Um, this is from um, some earlier Cambridge uh, worksheets that I think are absolutely splendid. My kids love derivatives. We do derivative showdowns where um, they break up into groups, they work collaboratively to see who can answer, uh, find the most derivatives first. Um, and it's wonderful because from one Latin word, they soon have not only 10 Latin words, but also 20 English words with all of their prepositions and suffixes. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Nobody has any. Do you ever have any trouble with them? Um students getting thrown off by the fact that there's so many like the blanks because they like is that does that intimidate them having to figure out the exact word or um will you ever give them a bunch of words that have that early yeah early on that's a good question early on um it really threw my ninth graders off um but then some of them either chose to ignore the blanks and come up with their own um, and then we would have conversations and i think those things are are just as important for assessment what is going on in their head that they are thinking they could be right. Sometimes they come up with synonyms that work just as well um, and don't fit the blanks. And sometimes they're completely off base. And that's an opportunity for discussion. It's not an opportunity to penalize them. It's an opportunity to see what they're learning, to see how they're thinking, and to see how you can push their ownership of vocabulary further. I know at one point when I was first doing compound, I mean, words that prefixes and suffixes, I was shocked when we had, I put a word that had port, a form of port in the middle of it, that my students didn't see the root. They said, this one doesn't have anything because they were looking at trans, we'll say for transportation. And at first I wanted to be frustrated with them. How could they not see the port? In? And then I realized that no one had ever talked to them or, or helped them to see that a word had parts to it, you know? So like you said, like it was something I had to shift in my thinking. It's pretty nice too that you can see um, the nugget of the word here. Yes. Like you can see POS and just to reiterate that before you even go into principal parts is very helpful for kids. In English, we have, we change it ourselves. Yeah, very good. Good point. Um, so Cambridge Latin of course has its own vocabulary review um, that you can do, but I really like these that are kind of under the language section um, because you can get to meanings through a host of different ways and think about vocabulary, I think in a much deeper sense, which words align with um, mood or which words align with tone. You can push this off into notions of characterization or with mood or tone if you're doing rhetorical devices and work in that direction. 
Oh, sorry, nice. go ahead. I was going to say, you can do them as a group, too. It's nice for them to do them by themselves, but you can also, as a group, have someone share their screen and have the class fall out what the answers are so you see that everybody's involved. You know, I used to do that back in the day when you had one computer and a board. You know, I'd say, go over these as a group and just make sure you know what goes where, you know, and it would really be a good review for the class. Depending upon how large um, your class is, I've got some small classes who love to do this as a group. And sometimes I will break them up and put them in charge. Like you're the person who gets to drag things um, yes. where they need to go and they love being in charge of it. And it's more community building. And it also gives the kid who's weaker some confidence. And, it, and if you didn't study or something, instead of getting called out on you're not studying, you get a chance to catch up. Exactly. Um, I've played around with my um, my objectives, um, what I call them. I, I think language to me, and it's going back to Cambridge's own language about um, how we think about grammar, translation, all of those things. Practicing the language is its own um, its own page um, in each uh, ch in each stage, and um, I've broken it down into spelling Latin words precisely. I don't do a lot of Latin composition, but I think sometimes it is important to have kids um, make sure that they are paying attention to those endings, the infixes, um, to distinguish between word forms in a sentence, um, to identify grammatical and rhetorical terms so I can talk about it with them, um, and to do a little bit of Latin composition or to do um, translation of Latin passages. So that's how I've broken mine up. Um, I caution you as you're thinking about designing your own objectives, not to get so weeded down in all the specificities or you won't be able to follow everything. You can make notes of those things, but kind of keep it whole enough so that you and your kids can really keep track of what you need to work on. So um, this is a wonderful example of two um, of the objectives that I just talked about. You've got a translation component on the far right of the chart. This is from a uh, Catullus unit. And then um, you're just identifying what kind of use is it through the grammatical term um, in the context. I almost always have students do things like this together uh, with partners, and then we check our work together. Um, again, the opportunity for collaboration and community building, I think is fundamental in any classroom and especially now. And they strengthen each other's remembering of what are the different clues to the, the subjunctives. If yeah, one says, no, no, it's got time to you, and it, it has to be, you know, result, that kind of thing. One of my, I'm glad that you brought that up. One of my students, early on, I, I have my students circle markers um, to identify the subjunctive. So they would circle the E in Demos, or they'd circle the IA in Audiant. Um, and um, it's wonderful as students are helping each other out. Um, not long ago, I had students saying, well, if you just circle um, what's inside, so they're like reiterating, they're repeating my own suggestions for helping them to identify. Um, and it was helping um, the partners work together as they were going through. Well, I just remember saying to kids, just as soon as you see that word roga in some form, you know what's coming. You know, you, you almost can be confident of what's coming, you know, and so, uh, you know, just and that's good for their sense of reasoning at all. I just want to tell you that a couple of people have said that they agree that these are the kind of things that help the kids listen and learn from each other. Yeah, and and we shouldn't be um, doing points on this. It should be an opportunity to say, um, here's how you recognize them. Um, and I think to further a discussion, why do you want the subjunctive in this way, and how is it functioning? Um, and that can lead you to some really interesting conversations in the class. Okay, uh, more translation and grammar. So um, some of my own um, handouts, I love doing illustrations with students. Um, I will often do a medley of things in one story. So um, they, for example, when they read a story like The Procession, Pompa, um, Cambridge has students identify where each um, group of people happens to be in the procession. Um, I might, after they um, illustrate what's going on in the procession, um, have them do what I call a swanky cool translation. That means that they can take liberties with their translation. Um, 
it's an opportunity for them to have fun. I have kids doing hip hop translations, Shakespearean translations, country and Western translations, um, G Rick translations. And then I um, will either do a grammar review that I'm asking them in a very tight section to be responsible for and to teach other students in a jigsaw, or I have them come up with the same things on their own. Um, so you come up with some grammar questions and answers and teach us. And it works on Zoom just as easily as it works in the classroom or asynchronously. Nice. I love um, the way that Cambridge sets up the teaching of direct and indirect commands. Again, with visualization, you've got this wonderful little speech bubble. Some of my kids can't write that tiny inside the speech bubble. And so I will um, tell them use a bigger piece of paper or use a post-it note, a big post-it note or an index card. What would um, what would the king be saying at this point? What would King Cognitiveness be saying in the speech bubble? And all you have to write is one word, like applaud. And then um, they work together on translating the difference between, hey, you applaud versus um, King Cognitiveness ordered the spectators to applaud the dancer. Um, and it's such a wonderful visual technique for teaching grammar. It gives you feedback for what kids are struggling with. It gives um, the kids feedback um, for what they need to work on. One, my kids are pretty articulate. They're like, I, I still, I think I can get direct commands. And um, they're savvy enough often to uh, say, I, I notice the quotes. And so I know it's a direct command, um, but sometimes I need a little bit of help in determining whether it's an indirect command or something else. Mm -hmm. um, these are quite fun if you haven't had a chance to play around with them on the Cambridge website. Um, and they have an option if you disagree with uh, the answer that you, um, so you get to select si me roga wises, and you choose res bondisem or duc system, and maybe you think that it has to be duc system, and you put that in the blank and you translate it, and um, you get an immediate uh, immediate score. So here you're getting something evaluative rather than an assessment, but you as a teacher aren't giving kids a grade off of this. Um, I always have my kids take screenshots over when they tell to the judge if they think that they're wrong or where they're struggling on practicing the language. Um, they love doing practicing the language online. And you can do this again as a whole class. You can do this in partners. Um, and the screenshots, I think, are particularly nice. I have kids keep um, portfolios of their screenshots so they can see where they've really uh, slowed down or what they found challenges in their learning or what they found easy um, and what they don't need to spend so much time on. You know, the teachers are often asking us, how do I see these scores? And they can't. You have to do the screenshots. But I don't think that's bad because then the students aren't having the stress of I'm doing this to prove something, you know, because let's face it, they could do it three times until they get the right answers. But, you know, the reality is they're still learning something along the way. So it can't be used to give a grade, but it can be used to help them get to a point where they own the material. And as you said, you can do a screenshot. And if you're honest, I suppose, you know. I, I think too, um, no one gets in a car and knows how to drive immediately. And we need to think about that with our students. Um, you aren't an expert the first time you see it. Um, maybe you do get something very quickly, one aspect or several aspects early on, but no one is perfect all the time in every way. Sammy, we have a question. Are the students taking screenshots of every single question or just the, la the final one? Oh, um, I leave it up to them with regard to what they want to take screenshots on. So if they feel as if their translation merited um, more than what the judge told them, they will screenshot it. Um, it could be the very final one. Um, if I'm doing it in class, um, I can see as they're working through, um, if they want to give me, and this is literally a snapshot of uh, their work and how they feel they're doing. And my kids have been pretty honest at this point. I'm lucky enough to have them for four years. So um, they're honest with me in saying, I'm not getting this at all. I need some help. And so this is representative of my work thus far. Um, and that tells me what we need to sit down together 
and uh, rework. And Thank I you. Sorry, go ahead. And I said, no, I love that trust that you build in them. That they're I willing to be, be open with you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fundamentally what we need to be doing with our kids. Um, I used to be such a gatekeeper with, oh, you didn't get that um, minus so many points. And um, I wasn't helping them. It was shutting them down. I, I think there are many uh, places, many rooms in the house of assessment in which we can get kids to learn and we don't we don't want to leave them behind as we're going to the airport we need them to to come with us on our trip so the two things that really struck me was with my students that i did the play for many years i also coached a sport and it wasn't like okay you can't kick the ball you're off the team or you can't sing as well as you should you 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 lose your part it was we have to work on this together and we together were working towards a performance it wasn't that I was sitting there as judge and jury, I was more coach getting them to the point where they could do it well. And that was a real shift for me in my grading too, to realize I don't always have to be the one saying off with your head. I could be like, this is the external thing that is going to measure it. We're gonna get you there. I think we um, as traditional academic teachers can learn so much from PE teachers, art teachers, music teachers, drama teachers. They know where it's at and they've been doing this kind of um, assessment with kids for much longer than we have. Um, we're just now stepping into it, I think. I think so too. Um, again, this is just another example, um, a language example about sorting um, to help kids identify tenses, um, infixes. Um, they can talk each other through it. It's the same Kind of party. My students really love these and find them particularly helpful, um, especially um, before we read something or after we read, like an immediate before or after rather than just kind of on its own in an isolated uh, bit. I always pair it with something that we're getting ready to read or as a follow up. I don't have grammar days. It's so important. Yeah. Do it in um, the context of what you're reading. Exactly. Um, and it's it's nice and fresh for them um, coming in as a pre or a post um, exercise. Um, this uh, little activity is nice just to um, reiterate singulars and plurals. My students, when they learn case endings, they learn them across. Um, they learn them down eventually, but I do have them learn like genitive is IES, IES, IES. And then genitive plural is arm, arm, um, and I hear them singing it when they're choosing which one, which I think is absolutely precious. Um, I love hearing them sing as they're going through their identifications and helping each other out. Sometimes they'll ask me to sing a little, uh, can you get me started on the genitive song? I'm like, oh, right, right, right. And so then they know in which direction to go. That's great. That's that great. Is so cute. We might have to record you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are flash captions with participles. Harry Noden has this book called Image Grammar, full of wonderful things that English teachers have been doing a long time. I just choose a bunch of pictures that have crazy actions. You can have the students write things first in English and then in Latin, or just have them write this in um, English if you feel more comfortable in that direction, whatever is um, the direction that you want to head. And what you want to do is Give them an opportunity for practicing and recognizing what a participle is through this kind of visualization technique. And then they're getting a little bit of writing. I almost always have students um, do like, well, you know the word for running, so what would that be? You know the word for jumping, what would that be? You know the word for falling, what would that be? Um, and then they share them out loud and they love them. Um, sometimes I had one kid who said that the jockey was lurching. Um, I mean, and had the crowds cheering. There's no crowd, but it's all imagined. And so they're really getting the idea of ING here. That's great. Reading comprehension is the fundamental component of um, what I do with my students, what Cambridge Lesson Course is all about. Um, I have students read aloud all the time. I have them um, listen to me read aloud so that they can hear both my pacing and my fluency, um, 
next to theirs as we work together. Um, I don't like interrupting them as they go through. I want them to um, get a sense of how you chunk a sentence together, what makes syntactical sense for them. Um, you can tell a lot when a student is struggling if they read flatly. That is one of your best indicators, as far as I'm concerned, early on for students um, who likely don't read in English a lot either. Um, if you can tell a lot about students um, when they act out a passage, if you have kids who are shy, just have them draw emojis next to their script and explain how they might have a character act out. That's fine too. Um, give them multiple opportunities for how they might express characterization. Um, kind of classic uh, reading components of um, character development, motivation, plot, and setting. Um, paraphrase and summarizing, I think, are one of the um, easiest things to do with kids. We're going to go through some um, uh, really fun ways to do those, um, as well as storyboards. Um, and I do storyboards all the time. My kids don't leave my classes without uh, really becoming expert stick figure artists. Um, and then letter E, you, you don't have to um, leave out rhetorical devices for your Latin ones. You can talk about those things early on. There's lots of stuff built into um, the Cambridge Latin course. Meter, a little bit later, of course, um, but rhetorical devices, you can um, have kids annotate very early. Okay, um, if you are interested in teaching flashback before you enter into the blue book, um, an easy way to do it, and a lot of kids are big Harry Potter fans, is to go to Harry Potter. Let me see if this will work. Um, looks like it's not playing. Um, I just pulled a little clip off of YouTube, and um, it's uh, the history of Harry Potter and how he gets the little lightning bolt scar on his forehead. And it's told in flashback. Use lots of opportunities for um, students to see visually before you dive into a Latin text so that they feel like they've already got ownership. A lot of my kids um, have incorporated flashbacks into their own retellings. Currently, my students um, they are putting Salvius on trial. Um, they are doing some of their work via flashback, uh, which is uh, super interesting to see. They um, have a Google document where they've gotten to reread a host of um, stories where Salvius is mentioned or appears from the blue book, the green book, and the purple book. And they've all divided up. Um, and it's, it's quite nice to see how they are using those same skills um, all the way now uh, into stage 40. One year I had my students describe their first memory of me in class, the first day of class or the first day of school. It didn't have to be me, but um, to get them to realize that, that you're talking in a different tense and it has a different kind of storytelling to it. And that helped a lot too, to give them that sense of when you talk about things that happened before, you know, you don't use the same words. Exactly. Um, it's an easy way to um, have students pay attention to imperfect and perfect tenses as soon as they move in. Um, this is another Globe Theatre activity, an easy way. Um, so let's say you had spring break and you come back, or maybe uh, you had some kind of pandemic and you haven't been online, and um, now you're just starting to teach again, and you want students to remember what happened in a previous story or stories. And you can do this thing called story whoosh. Story whoosh is um, where you have students reenact what happened in a story. Um, you can do an outline of the story yourself and have kids, um, you say, you two, uh, you're going to be these two characters, you're Salvius and Rufila, for example, um, and you hate each other. And you have them do little freeze frames. The minute you say whoosh, they sit down, you choose another couple of characters, it's quite fun when students are in person. It works really well, actually, on Zoom um, because uh, the kids all say whoosh and um, they stand up, they sit down, and they need that. We're sitting oh, down yeah. an awful lot in front of our computers. Um, mm -hmm. It's nice for them to get up and do these kinds of things. So wait a minute. I, I, I'm a little slow. So 
you're in class. Let's make believe it's an actual class. And you start, you pick two kids and you start to read part of that story where they hate each other. Yep. Or, okay. And then, um, like, so then if you want the slave to come in with the enslaved person and his, you know, talk to Salvius, would you have her sit down and the slave to come in or would you just pick so two I, new I pick two new people and I'll say, you're the slave and you're um, Rufila or whoever, it doesn't even matter. And um, after the first two people have been whooshed away, the next two people do a little freeze frame. Everyone gets to see it. It's an easy way. Like my kids have said, oh, yeah, I remember um, that uh, someone had uh, that. I, I, I'll just use like Helena had um, a really funny expression on her face. And that's how they remember that she was uh, Rufila um, in a particular story. So this is something that they don't prepare for. After they've read a story, you just throw out the characters at random and they pretty much do it on the spot. Absolutely. Great idea. Yeah, it is a great idea. And um, again, you're not giving them a grade for it. You're, you are listening to um, how uh, they, I've had kids say, wait, wait, what happened? You you left this part out. That's wonderful, right? That's wonderful when kids are correcting you on the summary that you created. You can have kids do the summaries as well. I have one student, Arius, who absolutely loves giving summaries. And so he's like, okay, I'll do it. And then he likes to boss people around. He's like, you two, up. You're going to be these characters. And then whoosh. And then he tells the next two. It's really fun stuff. And it and 10 years from now, you'll be going to his show on Broadway, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's got the directorial touch. Um, these paraphrases with um, images, I think, are quite nice. You get um, the story of Daedalus and Icarus, but it's shrunken down. Um, a nicely little condensed version. Um, I just took a screenshot of the first uh, six pieces. Um, if you look in the Cambridge Latin course uh, in stage 44, it's broken up into five sections. So if you want to give students an overarching preview of a story, this is a dynamite way to do it. You can do it as a follow-up activity as well. You don't need to give them a grade on it. It's an opportunity for them to either, oh yeah, I own this. I remember all of this after they've translated or um, to anticipate what they might um, already know. Um, I do tons and tons and tons of storyboards. Um, this is a Domatilla storyboard. Um, I've broken up the text. I think chunking up text is super helpful for kids, especially, um, I think uh, often people feel like this is something you only need to do with um, like the Cambridge Latin book. I do it with Catullus. I do it with Livy. I do it with Tacitus. Um, whatever the students are reading, I think to help them see how you break up a line, how you visualize a line is fundamental. Um, and I take a look at the speech bubbles. For example, I've got a speech bubble way down. Um, and a lot of my kids are like, is, is, is Domitilla a dog? Why is the speech bubble down so far? And <laughs> we have a, a conversation about, well, what's she doing in Horto and why? What, what might a, a slave woman be doing? Uh. That's cool. And then I give them an opportunity for what characters think versus what they say. Um, and they uh, can write them in Latin or in English. They can do emojis. There's a host of things they can um, play around with. You know, I never thought of that. I've always thought of, you know, somebody can rewrite a whole story from their own perspective. But that's a very cool idea to have them just put their, what they think the character's thinking. It gives them a voice. And again, you don't want to give them, you can um, put little, um, how did how did I think I did in this story? A lot of my students want to rate themselves on artistic skills. I don't give a hoot, uh, looking at Bacchio, about their artistic skills. I, I want them to feel as if they own the Latin. Um, I will often guide them through this. So I will read the Latin aloud expressively. And I will say, you've got 30 seconds on your market set, and it's a quick draw. They put their pencils or pens down by their side. They pull them up like they're in the wild, wild west, and then they draw. Oh, that's great. We have a couple of questions, Sammy. I think this goes back to the, the whoosh activity. Uh, so I'm understanding correctly that this activity is kind of a narr narrated charade? Absolutely. That's a wonderful way to state it. That's exactly right. 
Okay. And then how long do you give for each frame if you are reading the Latin aloud and they are drawing? Um, no more than 30 seconds. If it's a little bit longer, 45. Sometimes I say 10 seconds go. Like how much time do you need to draw a stick figure um, who's just shouting, where are you? Yeah, and is this a review of text they've seen already or the first time they've seen the text? Yes, sometimes it's a re review because I like to give them an opportunity to reread. Um, and then I will do a similar activity where I've paraphrased, I've uh, distilled some of the uh, lines from the story. Sometimes it's the whole story that I've broken down for them and I want them to move through it quickly. So you can do it in a variety of ways. You don't need to give them a grade on it. You can at some point later if um, I have some students who love drawing. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for them to spend lots and lots of time um, illustrating a story. And then you keep those, of course, where you scan them in because they're marvelous. So just one clarification, though, what you know, Cambridge is being on first read versus consolidation. So but it would most of the time be in your second read or your consolidation um, part of the uh, the, the lesson that you would do more of these kind of things, right? I mean, once in a while you might have them do them as a first read, but but more likely not, right? Is that what That's I'm hearing? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, this is just uh, another example from the book about characterization, character trait and proof. This is an old English teacher T chart, um, and I think it works quite well. And you can have the students list things in both Latin or in English up to you in uh, regard to what you want to do. You can take those traits and proof and you can have them turn it into something a little larger, um, another story, an essay, a diatribe, um, any of those things. Um, these are um, helpful, I think, especially when you are, are introduced to new characters in a story. How does Wilbia, for example, when you meet Wilbia, um, how does she connect to all of these other characters that we're meeting um, Latro, Rubria, Modestus, um, and then you draw lines. Um, and I have students who are really good with the drawing tools on Zoom um, or Google Docs. Um, there are, you can do things, uh, some kind of funky things on Pear Deck, um, kind of rudimentary if you're interested in, in drawing as well, um, or just have them hold up a sheet of paper with what they've drawn um, on the screen so that you can check it as well. You can also have them take pictures on their phone and send it to you. Uh, there's a host of ways um, from as easy um, to as complicated as you want to make it. Uh, Rereading and motivation. This is from the teacher's manual. Um, so Clemens is a freedman. You reread um, where you see something like Stottem. This is a classic opportunity to examine diction, um, how diction impacts character motivation, um, characterization, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then you can have students uh, draw or uh, write um, a little um, bio poem of Clemens, a uh, bio poem like a biography of Clemens. Um, you can have them uh, write letters. So there's a host of things that you can do, or you can just leave it and um, have it as an opportunity for rereading itself. Uh, this is from the um, uh, assessments um, that are tests that you can give students. You don't have to give tests um, at the end of a unit all the time. You can give them in the middle. What I particularly like about this is that it's asking for two emotions that Daedalus feels, his word choice, what do you, uh, why do you think Ovid addresses the reader here? There's a lot of opportunity I think fundamentally about what we want kids as good, sharp readers, they need an investment in what they're reading. Um, I, I had this wonderful but also terribly sad experience where I heard Mary Jo Bang from St. Louis um, read uh, Daedalus and Icarus at an Ovid marathon um, at, uh, at a museum. And um, I just remember being so moved by um, what she had read um, because her own son had died. And to me, that kind of personal connection, um, you don't want students to suffer, um, but you do want students to have empathy with what they're reading. Um, and I think this is, a, I, I cannot think of um, 
Ikara DK bat pe nas conspexit in undis. Like, I, I can't think about that line without having a little um, choke in the back of my throat every time I hear it. Absolutely. Um, this is another globe activity. Um, so you break up the text. It's called, I call it Dixisti you, Luper. Um, in English, it's, did you just say? Um, so a student reads a line. There are tons of opportunities that are broken up for um, students to look at a text um, and um, interpret tone or really just to interpret the line. Like, what exactly are you saying and how are you saying it? Um, and you can play around with all sorts of really fun things, asking students to read between the lines of um, a character, uh, their intent, um, tone, and mood setting. Um, again, collaboration. Um, I used to skip these. Um, I'm kind of ashamed that I did. Uh, I, I think they're quite wonderful and very easy to do in this age of online learning, where um, you can give kids a screenshot, give kid who uh, kid A a screenshot of just side A, and give kid B a screenshot of just side B, and ask them in their breakout rooms to um, work with each other, read to each other. And kid A has the answer. So kid A is going to let kid B know if it's right or if it's wrong. So um, and, uh, these are the Arate Dicates, right? Yes. Yes. And that's genius because I never use them either because I can never quite figure out their their purpose. And recently someone had explained if your idea of actually just giving them only half um, makes it really obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's super easy to do because they're not. I mean, they could take a picture and send it to their friend. Um, I mean, there are a host of ways to do it, but within sure, the space sure. of just a few minutes, they're not going to do that. And you're not giving them a grade. You're giving them an opportunity to read the Latin right. out loud. Yeah. Um, again, tone and mood. I do a lot of these asking kids to um, identify emojis. Um, I do a lot of this in setup before we do our putting salvias on trial. Um, so they're making mini movies themselves, um, a, a bunch of tiny movies that I film in class or they film um, before they do the kind of big uh, salvia on trial. Um, and then again, uh, this is swinky cool translation, but I ask kids to uh, perform them and you can grade this later if you want, um, but it also just gives you an opportunity, let the kids have fun. Let them show you what they know. Sometimes it's completely off. That's okay. Um, stop them and ask them why they chose to present a particular character or translate a particular line that way. And when you okay. said school, well, you said before that's like the cowboy or the, the, the um, California babe or whatever. You know, like yo babe, he's so cute. That's yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and so you're not being as picky with um with the words that are on the page they do need to um adhere closely to the text um close enough to the tense um and then you can talk about the kinds of directorial decisions they made in um transferring it in the way that they did um the last part is uh culture um and i do debates i do a lot of map work with my students um and then um we have a, a number of other Things where I show the culture videos on Cambridge, I think, are um, so important. Um, I, and they're only a couple of minutes long, so they're not a huge investment of your time. Um, so if you don't know about Boudicca, get to know horrible histories. I don't think I maybe I can play just a little so you can hear her. <laughs> Okay, so um, my students love, love, love Boudicca. They're all about um, singing this song. They want to start every day uh, singing Boudicca. Um, give them the buy-in. It gives them an opportunity to understand um, the history and the culture. Um, it sets them up later for, um, I have them watch a documentary, Boudicca, Queen of the um, the Kenny. Um, I ask them questions about what do you think of Boudicca? Again, a lot of these personal connections, you're not grading them on it. You're giving them an opportunity to give you feedback about what they like and what they think and valuing their opinion. 
Um, and then this is what the whole class debate would look like. I used to do a lot of debating. Um, I'd be happy to explain this in further detail. It's actually not so scary. A lot of kids who know how to debate um, have no problem. They step right into it. I just asked them to write a paragraph. You can do it as a whole class debate. You can have um, uh, students who decide if they want to. Um, I want to debate about De uh, Boudicca. Somebody else can debate about the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so you spread out your debates um, throughout the course of the semester. Um, again, they choose. Uh, I bring outside people to choose who won. Um, but I'm not giving them a grade on who won. I'm giving them a grade at some point on how uh, they collected their evidence and what they wrote. Um, and then this is again, um, you can show clips from Ben Hur. This suggestion, uh, create a radio or television commentary for a visit to the races is straight out of the uh, teacher's manual. It's an easy way for students to practice. I'm uh, Ruber, Ruber, go for the red team. Um, as as Ben Hur and the chariot uh, as the chariot races are going on in the film, um, I can't seem to get any of the YouTube links to work. Um, but there you go. Um, and then uh, the uh, worldly connections, the inscriptions. When my students head off to Vienna, they have an opportunity to. I do a lot of um, inscription work ahead of time. We look at them in museums. I show them other examples. Every one of my kids knows that Dies Mabus is to the spirits of the underworld, every one of them. Um, and if they don't, I really haven't done my job. They make their own inscriptions. Um, and I have a whole sheet on this um, and we display them all over um, the school, um, <laughs> much to the frustration sometimes of people who would like to hang up other things besides Roman inscriptions. But um, kids read them and they want to know um, what Roman texting was like. So that's it. Oh, thank you so much. oh, Sammy, that was really terrific. So many wonderful ideas. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. And apparently we didn't get our introduction in before you started like we normally do. Just wanted to let everybody know that um, Sammy is a longtime CLC user, as you can tell by her terrific ideas and examples from the Cambridge Latin course. She's uh, been using the course since 2008. Uh, she's been teaching for about 16 years, and uh, she's been a, a presenter at our workshops in the summer, and she also, uh, as you can tell from this, uh, has done several webinars for us. So we are just delighted to have you back, and thank you so much for all these outstanding suggestions.